Hi, my name is John Savoy, and in this video I want to talk about disaster recovery to Azure. So this is based around the idea that I have various assets running on premises and I want to protect them to the cloud. Um, and when we think traditionally about disaster recovery, normally we have two locations. I maybe have a primary location and maybe a DR location. And my goal is I would replicate the services between those locations. If this went down, I could fail over to here. I may run them in an active-active configuration, so I have things running in both of them, but I have enough capacity to at least be able to fail over to sort of tier one, the critical apps in the event of a disaster. We then introduce this kind of Azure, these cloud services. And it's often kind of confusing, well, how do we use that? And as I talked about in previous videos, essentially, Azure can become an extension of your data center. I can create virtual networks in Azure, I can do site-to-site -site VPN, I can use Express Route, and essentially I just get IP routing between them. So I can really think about Azure just as an extension. And while there are very specific Azure site recovery services, before you think about those, you should think about, well, how would I normally achieve kind of disaster recovery for a workload? Imagine, for example, I'm running a domain controller on premises. How would I normally make that highly available? Well, I would have another domain controller here and I would let multi-master replication that's just part of Active Directory take care of that. I would probably want to do the same thing here. I would stand up one or more DCs in Azure. I would have some kind of site-to-site -site VPN or express route. And I would just let kind of multi-master replication take care of that. Maybe I had SQL Server down here. Well, maybe I stand up a SQL Server in here and I can do always on. Maybe it's a file server, I can use DFS replication. I have these options. I would think about how would I normally protect it? So I always think an application level protection is better than something at a hypervisor or a storage level. I think of an exchange server. If I have a mailbox server, and I just replicated that at the storage level or the hypervisor, if that went down in a kind of unplanned way and then the hypervisor just restarted it in another location, I may lose a few minutes of data. Uh, the database may be in a dirty state and has to do integrity checks, it takes longer to start, and I may have lost messages. If instead I use database availability groups, which is just a feature of exchange, it's replicating the messages between two instances, and in the event this one failed and it maybe missed a few messages, that replica can go and talk to the hub server and say, hey, did I miss any messages? And it can resend them. So there's no dirty database, there's no integrity checks, there's no lost messages. It's a, it's a richer failover experience. So okay, but what about if I, if I don't have this? What if I do want to use kind of a hyper-level capability? Now what was originally introduced? and I'm actually going to leave that there for the time being, was the idea that Hyper-V had something called Hyper-V Replica. And Hyper-V Replica could potentially take the storage of a virtual machine and asynchronously replicate it to another site, and then that could obviously be linked to another VM. And on top of all of this, I would kind of have System Center VMM managing that. And the way this actually worked for Azure is basically it was Hyper-V Recovery Manager, HRM. And it was really an automation solution. Nothing was replicating to Azure. Simply, Azure would talk to kind of the on-premises SCVMM, and there might be another SCVMM over here. And this HRM solution would communicate with them, it would help set up the replication, it would perform the failover, I could have steps of failover. Because I had VMM with a library, I could run scripts. So as part of my failover, I could say, hey, run this script as part of the failover. But nothing was going to Azure, other than bits of command traffic. The replication was on-premises to on-premises. So that's, and that's still there. So if I just want to have some kind of orchestration to help me, hey, a big red button, say failover, I can do that and I can license. But it's now Azure Site Recovery, ASR.
but it does more than that. Because people said, hey, look, I'm hyper the on-premises, and really behind the scenes, your hyper be up here. So why can't I replicate to Azure? And that's a very, very reasonable request. And so this has kind of evolved. And so now what I can do is actually start a new picture. So I, I still have Azure. I kind of have a, a storage account. I can have my on-premises. And I have my VM with its disk, its VHD. It could be a VHDX file. Uh, ASR will actually take care of converting it between VHDX and VHD. VHD is all Azure supports today as part of that. So now what actually happens as part of Azure Site Recovery or ASR, Hyper-V Replica is being used to replicate the changes, the contents of this disk into an Azure storage account. Now I want this to be a geo-replicated, geo-redundant storage account. And I'll explain why in a second. So basically this VHD exists up here. And as the changes happen, it replicates into Azure. Now I can have SCVMM on premises, but I don't have to anymore. In a branch scenario, I may not have SCVMM. So I can actually do this without SCVMM. But if you have SCVMM, that's great. It makes it easier to map SCVMM as logical networks. Um, I can have some of that scripting capabilities. It gives me a little bit extra. Um, but I, I can do it without it. So this is now, it's still using the Hyper-V replica as a channel, as a way to replicate the data. But this is now just part of Azure Site Recovery. I can create recovery plans so I can group VMs together. I can say, hey, fail over this group and then perform this action and then this group. It can hook into Azure Automation. Azure Automation is PowerShell workflows running in Azure, which can really do anything. I can insert things, say, hey, perform a manual action here and then tell me when that's done so I can carry on. So I'm replicating this. In the event of a disaster, I can then eventually fail over. And at that point, when I perform the failover, that's when it kind of instantiates a VM in Azure and it links it to that VHD and it starts. So the key point here is there is no VM in Azure until I fail over. I am not paying any compute for the thing. All I'm really paying for would be storage because this is traffic into Azure, which is ingress, there's no charge for that anyway. But what's actually great, if I buy ASR licenses, I license it per VM as part of an enterprise agreement, I actually get 100 gigabytes of storage in Azure for each VM, and it's portable. So I have 10 VMs, I get one terabyte of storage, and I can break that up and have one really big VM, some really small VMs, I pull all that together. I get a certain amount of storage transactions as well, I get a certain amount of egress, I so I can replicate back and fail back, because failing back is pretty important. So at the point of a failover, there's been a disaster, I hit the button, it goes through the recovery plan that I've defined, that does it into groups, then it creates the VM, and now it's running in Azure. Now, for the Hyper-V mode, it is not replicating back continuously, which is why this needs to be geo-redundant. And so, if there was a disaster at this Azure data center, everything going on here is actually replicated to the part, the paired Azure region, hundreds of miles away. Remember, everything's stored three times here, it's replicated, it's stored three times at another Azure region as well. So I'm confident that data is secure. So I'm running and now I want to fail back. When I want to fail back, remember this is the kind of Hyper-V, I should really kind of stress this, this is kind of the, using the Hyper-V replica technology to do this. There's kind of two modes I can do this. It can work out the deltas if I'm not using encryption up here and send the changes back and then shut down and whatever's left send the remaining changes, and then it starts it up here, and then we'll start replication back again. Or I can just shut the thing down up here, and do that sync back down, and then start it here again. So obviously I can fail back, that's kind of an important part. And remember, I can still do on-premises to on-premises, I don't have to replicate to Azure. So that's great, so if I'm a Hyper-V shop, I can use Hyper-V replica technology, I replicate the storage, I'm not paying for any compute until I actually have a disaster, then it creates the VM and links it to that disk. And it's whatever the capability set is of Azure I can leverage. So I can have lots of one terabyte disks, so I can replicate lots of data to this thing. If a workload is supported in Azure, then I can protect it with this. But what if I'm not a Hyper-V shop? 
what if I am a VMware shop? So down here, instead of this being Hyper-V, this is ESX. And I, I have a virtual machine. And I would like to protect that. Now I can't just replicate a VMDK file because ESX uses VMDK, that's not compatible with Hyper-V. So Microsoft recently acquired InMarge. And as part of that, you've got this InMarge Scout technology. So this actually runs within the guest operating system itself. So when I think about a operating system, there's a number of different layers. There's the file system, there's volume management, etc., etc. And what I think about happens if, if, I, if I drill this out, if I kind of have kind of the disk and the, the volume manager and I have the, the file system, what Scout does is it has kind of its mobility services agent. It injects that between kind of the file system and the volume manager. As changes come down through here, those changes are kind of captured and they go to say called a process server. And this is running on premises, so it's another VM. So it gathers all those changes, all those writes, and then it sends them up in something called a master target, which is running in Azure. The master target has a bunch, again it's in the storage account, a bunch of VHDs attached to it. So as the writes come in, as the writes were occurring to that virtual machine, the writes are captured, they're sent to this process server, they're bundled up, they're sent to this master target in Azure, who then writes them to the corresponding virtual hard disk in Azure that would represent this protected virtual machine. It was a configuration server up here to kind of manage the thing. But you can see, change occur, changes are sent up into a VHD. At the same time, it takes care of taking out things like the VMware integration tools. They're gonna to be stripped out as part of this process. The thing would just start. So it doesn't care about the hypervisor. It's not seeing a VMDK file. This is running in the guest. It doesn't care. It could be a physical machine. Where we do care is obviously I want to be able to fail back because there's certain workloads supported at different times. But it can capture things running within the guest, it sends it up, and again in the event of a failover, it's at that point it creates the VM, it disconnects the VHD from the master target and maps it to the VM. Again, I start paying for it only if I fail over, or I can do a test failover, where it would still do in the replication and I can select an alternate network that would actually go and leverage. So I can obviously test that process. The difference between the Hyper-V replica and the InMarge Scout is that, or just Scout technology I should say, is that it can actually do a continuous replication back. It can kind of reverse that flow, so the fail back can actually be easier. So that's kind of in an ESX world. And you could see in the future potentially Microsoft could open this up to other workloads. It doesn't have to be ESX because it, it really doesn't care. You just have to focus on that fail back experience that's kind of important. So I can protect Hyper-V, to Azure. I can do Hyper-V to Hyper-V. I can use this Scout technology to ESX to ESX staying on premises. I can do ESX to Azure. It can also hook into things like SQL Always On. It can manage that. I can manage um, SAN to SAN replication. It can hook in via SCVMM to the SMIS capabilities are there to manage your SAN failover. And you can really think that it starts to bring all these different things together into a single disaster recovery, a single failover type technology to really kind of help you, hey, I've got this big red button, I want to perform a failover. Um, I license this per VM, as I said, there's two different licenses. There's one if I'm kind of doing on-premises to on-premises, where this is really just an orchestration solution. And there's one I'm replicating to Azure, where it's actually the target for disaster recovery. Obviously, as you can imagine, it costs more for the license when I'm replicating to Azure. Um, but again, I do get, if I buy it as part of an enterprise agreement rather than direct, I do get sort of the 100 gigabytes, there's that is a million storage transactions, and I think 100 uh, gigabits of egress to actually replicate and fail back. So it's just a kind of a, an overview of how I can think about disaster recovery to Azure. But key point, this is fantastic technology, be it Hyper-V, be it ESX, be it on-prem to on-prem or on-prem to Azure, SQL always on, SAN, but I don't necessarily want to think of that first. If the workload has a native capability that has its own disaster recovery, I generally would prefer to do that. Now, 
there is an exception. Because you may notice a big difference here. When the app-to-app -app protection is going on, I'm replicating and talking to the workload running in Azure, i.e. it's up and running. We have the Azure Site Recovery, I'm just doing storage and the VM isn't running unless I fail over. I am not paying any compute, which is the bulk of the charges. So one thing I have to consider is how critical is it that I have that app-to-app, -app, that I maybe have that quicker recovery time, maybe a, a quicker recovery point objective. Because it's probably going to cost me more. There might be licensing implications with this. The VMs are running. So maybe for the top tier, absolute critical, maybe I would do app-to-app. -app. But if it's not as critical, if I can take maybe, these are just numbers I'm throwing out, maybe a, a slightly longer recovery time, I might lose a little bit more data, I might say, hey, this is a disaster situation. In a disaster, I can lose 10, 15 minutes of data, whatever, depending on the technology and the frequency. I can lose a little bit extra, and I'd rather save myself maybe that potentially hundreds of thousands rather than having all these VMs running in Azure. So although, yes, app to app is generally best, cost is obviously an issue as well. So if you decide that this is a disaster, touch wood, it's never gonna happen, I'm willing to save myself hundreds of thousands of dollars, I'd rather just do the Azure Site Recovery technology. So that, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much.